Well, thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I'm I'm completely at your mercy. Uh, I, I was given two hours or an hour fifty minutes. Um, I somewhat divided this talk into two parts. So this this is the destination, but as with any like decent journey, like the fun part is the journey too. So I'll I'll start in the first part to tell you about the problems I was caring about when I ended up like thinking about this. So the first part will be more about geometric problems I was studying, the kind of results we now know about them, and then it will sort of start to build up to getting to spectral networks and more slow trees. So that will be in part two. So um, let me start with the geometric goal or a problem that motivated me. So geometric problem. In particular, it belongs to the realm, the realm of uh, four-dimensional symplectic topology, and it's given as follows. The problem is I give you the four ball. So you think of this as being the four ball, T star R2 if you wish. So a space that from a symplectic viewpoint might not have a lot of interesting things. There are no exact Lagrangians. If you computed something like the Fukaya category, uh, say Rap Fukaya category, it would be zero. So a priori, not much interesting things if you're thinking, especially in the exact setting. Nevertheless, there's a way to rigidify the problem that makes everything turn into a very interesting problem. And that is by adding asymptotics. So I'm going to add to the infinity boundary of this, what we call a Legendrian. So I'm gonna draw a knot here. So not like this, and this is going to be denoted by a lambda. Now, what lambda is, it's a subset of the boundary of D4, or another way of saying it is you take T star of R2, and now you take the boundary at infinity, if you wish the unit cotangent bundle, so that lies inside of this as the boundary, and this is symplectic, and the Liouville form in here induces here something we call a contact structure, and what it is in three-dimensional setting is at every point in this three-dimensional manifold, there is a hyperplane, there's a two-dimensional plane. And being Legendrian literally means that the tangent space of lambda always belongs to that two plane. If you don't care about Legendrians in contact manifolds, fair, you can just think that Legendrian is the kind of asymptotic conditions for a Lagrangian that makes analysis particularly nice. Lagrangians typically at infinite will not intersect into a Legendrian. It's a could I mention one condition. Uh, but if you put that as a condition, you get these nice asymptotics. So here's the geometric problem. Study in an ideal world, classify. Lagrangian fillings of lambda. And by that I mean study all possible embedded exact Lagrangians in the four ball whose asymptotics are exactly given by lambda. So these are Lagrangian fillings L of lambda. Okay, now several comments on this regard. These Lagrangian fillings are going to be exactly exact, and they're going to be embedded in four-dimensional space, and they're gonna be, as I said, Lagrangian. So L, is such that the boundary is given by lambda. And the second comment about this classification problem is up to what? And here I'm gonna write it in a different color and it's up to Hamiltonian isotopy. So there's certainly infinitely many of these guys. Whenever I draw one, you can quote unquote wiggle it a bit and you get another one. But you want that this wiggling, which is typically performed by a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism, or by, by integrating a vector field which behaves well with a symplectic structure, um, you quotient by those guys. So this is quotient by Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms, and say for now with compact support. So what I'm saying is suppose you've built one of these guys. So suppose you've built one such surface. So you've succeeded in finding an embedding of say a genus two surface, whose asymptotics are exactly given by this Legendrian knot, such that the surface is embedded, the surface is exact, and its boundary is lambda. 
Now you will consider two such guys to be the same if I can go and wiggle this a bit through Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms. For all intents and purposes, we want these guys to be the same if they're related by Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms. That's the same thing as saying two guys are the same even only if they are connected by a family of exact Lagrangian fillings. So it's either notion is natural and they actually do coincide. Um, does, does the problem make sense so far? Any words that somebody's allergic to or want, want any kind of explanation? Okay. Exact means that if I integrate the Liouville form in here, I always want that to give me a zero along any period, which is to say the Liouville form, when considered as a Duram one form, that's always zero, which is to say lambda restricted to L is of the form D of F for a certain function F in L. Are we with that? Okay, so this is uh, one of the problems that in the last few years I, I, I bumped into and I found interesting. And I can tell you about some initial results that uh, were around and, and they're not maybe like part of what I have been doing. So initial results. So that's mostly 90s, this is 90s, early 2000s, so on and so forth. So let me tell you first something that I find particularly enlightening, which is striking difference between this setting and the smooth one. So this is different from the smooth problem. So in smooth topology, you could go, you could go to a GNT conference and say, I'm gonna study the following. I'm going to study the four ball, I'm gonna fix a knot at the boundary the unknot, the trefoil, and I'm gonna study all surfaces which are smoothly embedded in the four ball and bound that smooth knot. I suspect most topologists would tell you, good luck with that. Meaning this is literally as hard, if not even a bit harder than four dimensional knot theory, namely the study of embedded S2s inside of S4s. If you've tried to do four dimensional smooth topology, it is a subtle business. Um, so for instance, I could take the unknot as a smooth knot and I could have surfaces of arbitrary genus bounding it smoothly, right? Are we okay with that? Like I have a disc that bounds the end knot, I can push it inside, but now there I can go and just smoothly add some genus, more and more genus. So the genus is in no way determined by the boundary, first issue. And second issue, I can have the end knot and yet have a disc inside which is knotted in four dimensions that bounds it. That's, that's a significant issue. So um, those are problems that make the topological problem, the smooth problem challenging. However, they do not happen in this setting. So first result, so this was Eli Ashberg and Poltorovich in 96. First claims that there's some hope, says if lambda is the unknot, so there's a unique Legendrian unknot with what we call max TV, but Essentially, all possible Legendrians such that the underlying smooth type is the end knot are understood, and they either do not bound a Lagrangian, that can happen, or if they do bound, there exists a unique Lagrangian disk bounding it. So again, maybe I've not emphasized that enough. In the smooth setting, you can always find a smooth surface bounding a knot. In the symplectic setting, that is by no means the case. There's many Lagrangians and many asymptotic that you could give such that there's just no Lagrangians at all bounding them. So that happens. Okay, to make this problem interesting, let's assume that happens. Not that that's an easy problem. We don't have a reasonable characterization of that. But suppose we've chosen an lambda for which we know some of these guys exist. Well, first good news, suppose you choose lambda to be the end knot, actually you have a unique Lagrangian. So again, big contrast. In the smooth setting, this is literally smooth theory of knots in four dimensions, in the symplectic setting, suddenly you have a discrete answer and you know exactly what it is. Second fact, the genus of L is determined by the boundary. So this thing is determined by the boundary. So just by knowing lambda, you can extract a number called the maximum, uh, sorry, called the thurston banneken invariant. And out of that number, which you can kind of combinatorially by counting number of crossings and cusps and do some, some combinatorics like that, you get, that number tells you what the genus is. So you will not be in a situation where you have one Legendrian at the boundary 
that bounds a genus two surface and independently it bounds a genus one surface. That does not happen. If the filling is orientable, that genus will be given to you immediately. Does that, does that make sense as two pieces of evidence that this is quite different? So that made me hopeful, that, that kind of telling you, well, maybe there's a way to classify these guys or in, in some sense, like start to get things going. Okay. The second thing is, okay, once you believe your problem might have a reasonable solution, you try to do things that have worked in the past. And one thing that has certainly worked in algebra geometry is to consider model I spaces. Namely, try to build some space, probably an algebraic variety, whose points are conjecturally, or you hope that whose points are exactly those Lagrangians. And then you try to say something about this. So there are modelized spaces that kind of work for that. So modelized spaces for such Lagrangian fillings can be constructed by uh, either floor theory or the theory of sheaves. So it can be built by what we call sheaf theory, or the microlocal theory of sheaves to be precise. So this is the first important category that enters the picture, sheaves sub lambda of R2. The complete name for this guy is, it's the category of sheaves in R2, which are constructible with respect to the stratification given by a front of lambda, and further, the singular support is contained in lambda. You can think of this as a DG category, so that's the first DG category that um, serves as a modelized something, or there's a second option, um, which is floor theory, and what does floor theory mean here? So floor theory here means you take some invariant of the Legendrian at the boundary, so out of this guy, you can do floor theory. So now Lagrangians intersect because they're half dimensional. If you take a Lagrangian and you kind of move it a bit, it will intersect in a discrete number of points. For Legendrian knot, if you move a Legendrian knot, clearly there's no intersection, right? A knot, if you move it around, it doesn't intersect the knot. Too, too, too high could I mention. So the way floor theory works there, think in terms of the path space, is by studying trajectories whose asymptotics are not given by an intersection point, but rather by what's called a rep chord. So that's some string that starts at one of the knots and ends at the other part of the knots. And, and the vector field that, uh, so th this, these chords are integral curves of a vector field that has particular uh, connections to the Liouville structure that you choose. It's very sensitive to that choice of Liouville structure. You can cook up an invariant that I'll discuss more in part two called the Legendrian DGA. And then you can consider modules over this or some kind of category over this. So let's take this. And when I write mod, I probably mean DG and, and perfect, like the right adjective to make things work the right way. So let's explain the quotations. What is precise is to say the following. If I have a Lagrangian filling with a local system in it, then it gives an object in this category or this category. You wouldn't be far from the truth if you thought these two categories are the same in an appropriate sense. Okay, um, maybe. So this is the algebra generated by the rep chords of lambda. So this is a knot in R3. Okay, it's Legendrian. So now what you do is you take, you position it in a generic way, such that there's finitely many vertical trajectories, literally in the z-axis, that start at your knot and end at your knot. Those are called rep chords. So you take the free algebra, make it commutative, if that's better, generated by all these rep chords. There's some kind of grading. That part is kind of trivial. You just have a free algebra. But what's interesting about floor theory is that it tells you how to take a differential. That differential is going to count, in this case, several homomorphic strips in that three manifold times R, such that the asymptotics, the positive asymptotics are always one chord, and the negative asymptotics can be arbitrarily many chords. So I don't, if you've ever seen floor theory of other types, it's like many on the top, many on the bottom, or sometimes genus is allowed. No, here the only thing that we know rigorously is one positive puncture on the top, many on the bottom. And that's, that's about it. Yeah. 
All right, so we know that a Lagrangian filling with a choice of a local system will give you a point in here, an object in here, sorry, or uh, an object in here. Can you hear one question? Yeah. If I give you two points at the moduli space and view them as objects in a category, I, mean, I can compute half between yeah. the two objects. But in Correct. Moduli space description, what's the meaning of half? Yeah. Well, the answer is the moduli space is a D minus stack. It's, it's, it's a derived stack. So in particular, you know, in the definite, we should go to like the foundation of stacks, but um, so, so let's ask with endomorphisms first, right? What does it mean for the endomorphism of an object at a level of, of spaces? That roughly is going to be encoding the cotangent complex of the model I at that space. Now, if you're in the case where the model I space is smooth or it's a nice scheme, Okay, that's boring. It's, I mean, it, it's, it is what it is, the cotangent sheaf, but it is concentrated in degree zero. When you have a stack, you have a complex at every point, right? So it has its own cohomology, and the cohomology of the cotangent complex of a stack measures the derived deformations of that object at that point, right? So it's like infinitesimal deformation theory where H0 measures the automorphisms, H1 measures infinitesimal deformations, H2 measures obstructions to that, H3 measures you know, lifting of obstructions, three-dimensional CCGs. Yeah, so now, yeah, the common following that is to say, you can work with these categories, so these guys are categories, but in either case, whatever choice you make, I'm just going to call it M lambda is the modelized space. Now, of course, Peng's question makes perfect sense for that, which is what the space mean. The general correct thing to say is the uh, minus stack. So this is the model of set of perfect objects of a category, of a smooth digit category. These are smooth digit categories uh, as defined by Toen and Bakier. So see Toen and Bakier's definition of these objects. This is in order to have a solid mathematical foundation for it. Okay. Now, in general, these spaces are kind of wild. They're very interesting to me, but if you just have an arbitrary lambda, they get challenging. So let me, for the talk of today, not have an arbitrary lambda, but have exactly lambdas that come from a positive braid beta. So I'm gonna choose any lambda that can be constructed like this. You choose a positive braid beta, any positive braid of any number of strands that you want, and then you close it up you can close it up in many ways. You can do the obvious way, which is you close it up like that, or you can close it up by what we call the minus one closure. I, I really don't care how you close it, like both. This is the most general way to close it up. So for today's talk, the input data for the asymptotics are going to be provided by beta, okay? If you change beta, we can still run part of the theory, but these guys become much more, more subtle. So if you have a positive break beta, this will be a fine varieties. We can say a lot of things about them. Otherwise, there actually are genuine stacks and not isomorphic to the truncation. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So this, in, this, yeah. That's that's a good that's a good point. It, it, it includes all algebraic knots, algebraic links. So. In the case of an algebraic link, one such Lagrangians is of that sort. We do not know that all of them come from that, right? If we knew that, for instance, you would kind of say all of them are special, like, right? Because, like. Well, when you say one of them, does your modular space have to be connected to components? So this guy comes and um, would describe what one. No, no, no. no. So, so, okay. Okay. Let's, let's be precise about this. So, what, what, what I said here is that here you have, you're gonna have some space some, with topology and with asymptotics, it, it, it will be some, some interesting space. Um, what I said is if you have a Lagrangian filling L with a local system in it, that defines a point, okay? So now there's many components depending on the rank of the local system. So if we do rank one local system, and let's do that. So let's fix rank one local systems. This is equivalent 
in this language we would say the micro local rank the micro local rank is one and in this language we would say we are looking at rank one modules if we do that then what's happening is that one lagrangian l it gives a chart a torrid chart which is exactly let me call this chart tl it gives a chart which is h1 of the lagrangian with c star local systems so, so gl1 c local systems so one lagrangian filling gives you i don't know how to legitimately draw like a, a torrid chart but one Lagrangian gives you an open toric chart. Another Lagrangian L prime will give you some other toric chart in here. So this would be T of L prime, this would be T of L. Does that make sense? Now, you can ask the question of, are there finally many such toric charts? Say, so you could ask, are there finally many feelings in the sense that I study these charts and I only see finally many? In some cases, we conjecture yes. In general, we've proven no. So in general, there's going to be infinitely many such many charts coming from fillings. That's going to be stated here in like 10 minutes. So there's usually infinitely many fillings that they literally give you infinitely many such charts. Um, and then you would hope that there's some kind of combinatorial or nice structure, at least in the case of Legendrians coming from a braid beta, that will allow you to classify them. And that's where the clusters come in. Does that answer the question? I, I wasn't talking about the the trifold. Uh, no, sorry. So um, going from one chart to the other, does the topology of the curve stay the same? Or? Yes. Even the smooth embedded type stays okay. the same. Even the exact Lagrangian type okay, stays so the so same. Right. So, yes, I understand what you're saying. Um, so the short answer is there is a non-abulanization picture kind of like that, but it's, it's not that story. So here we're going to fix the rank one to stay the same. Okay, and the, the, the most terrible degeneration you're going to have is that this guy goes from being embedded to being immersed. So not bad, there's just features. There's some points in this space that are in none of these charts. And what they are is they're represented by some immersed Lagrangian fillings. So for instance, in the case of the Hopling. Oh, yeah. Is, for example, the genus of the curve the same as the genus of the whole plane curve uh, in complex settings? Yeah, yeah, it is. It will be, okay. it, but it's not just that. The smooth embedded type is the same. It's Exactly, yes, yeah. If you think of the singularity, these are all smoothly isotopic to the Milner fiber of the singularity. Like in particular, they're the same surface, but even amb amb ambiently, yeah, they're the same. Um, okay, any other questions? All right. Yeah. Yes. No, no, no. So a derived stack um, is something that goes from simplicial commutative K algebras, right? But let's say we're working characteristic zero. So instead, I model Dalt correspondence. I model simplicial commutative K algebras by non negatively graded DGAs. So when you're feeding these guys in characteristic zero, you can just think that I feed it a non negatively graded DGA. And it outputs something, right? Like if I feed it the complex numbers, it tells me the complex points. If I feed it FQ, it tells me the like FQ rational points. And if I feed it some DG algebra, it's gonna tell me like something about points and like deformations of it. Does that make sense? Sure. Okay. So for say you feed like a DGA, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Um yes. So it gives you the mapping stack. So it's gonna give you an infinity um groupoid, right? That infinite group is going to be the mapping stack from your guy, your CDGA, into perfect complexes over that category. That is the that is the Toenvaki sort of definition. Like, 
And then, you, then what you want to prove is that that stack is nice enough in the sense that if the category was smooth, then you want to say that that's like locally geometric. Like that you want to say good properties about that. And that's true. Like what I'm trying to tell, what I was trying to say is like this stack is particularly nice among all derived stacks. And in fact, if you choose beta to be a positive braid, that's actually an affine variety. And the stack is just like the derived locus of some nice polynomial. So, you know, take the causal resolution of something. It's nothing like super elaborate at that level. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, good point. Any other questions? All right, so let me tell you a couple, couple of statements about this so you get a, a sense of what this picture uh, is looking like. So first of all, there's the cluster existence theorem. Um, it states the following. It says, so let beta be a positive braid. And you take that lambda beta as your asymptotic for your Lagrangian fillings. It's Legendre link. Then that model I space has a nice structure that fits very well with this kind of picture. So then the ring of functions of M lambda, M lambda beta beta is a cluster algebra so that's the first important statement we, we will try to unpack what that means furthermore the cluster variables can all be named Symplectically, so you never needed like any particular setup of the beta part. You can just name certain things, and these cluster variables that belong to every cluster are have sort of. What I'm trying to say is this has an intrinsically geometric meaning. Intrinsic geometric definition, and then you go and compute. What's hard in the general case is not to give this definition, this definition we have, what's hard is to show that the regular functions. Okay, so what is, what is this saying? So let's go back to this kind of space. So you have your space that you've constructed out of a category. And this space, which is M, M lambda, what you know, as I said before, is that one filling will give you a chart TL. Another filling will give you another chart TL prime. And you can ask very first question, how much of the space do I cover by considering historic charts coming from Lagrangian fillings? Is it, is it the case that there's only finally many and then the rest of the space I don't access, so on and so forth? The first consequence of this theorem, I, I know it's stated kind of algebraically, but the first geometric consequence of this theorem is that the space up to co-dimension you because I mentioned too, is completely covered by these charts. So there is a way to have toric charts covering your space entirely up to what I mentioned too. The what I mentioned too is because of Hartog's phenomena. Because any, anything you're going to say about the ring of regular functions, you know, we'll never see anything in what I mentioned too, because you have an holomorphic function in C2 minus the origin that extends to the origin. So that, you know, there's no difference between, you know, this is an indefinization. So the first statement is the geometry of this model I space has this property. It can be up to what I mentioned too covered by the historic charts. And the second highly non-trivial statement is that not only you can cover by toric charts, but each of these toric charts comes with a system of coordinates. Let me call these coordinates A1, A2, A to the 2G, because it's gonna have dimension 2G if uh, the fillings have genus G. And these coordinates change in a very specific way. So not only do I have a particular system of coordinates in each thing, these coordinates can be named, these are the cluster variables. These cluster variables are the A1 through A to G. 
And when you go from one filling to another, to another, to another, the transition functions in here are not just any transition functions. Like think how you build a space, think how you build a complex manifold. Transition functions could be as wild as you want. But being a cluster algebra means that these transition functions are given by a particularly combinatorial formula called quiver mutation. So the transition functions here are given by quiver mutation. This is quiver mutation. So that's the first thing you learn about this space. Up to what I mentioned you, it can be covered by toric charts. And furthermore, each toric chart comes endowed with a canonical set of functions such that when you compute the transition functions in this particular set of functions, you get a formula which is universal. It only depends on the so-called the quiver in some combinatorics that you can read from lambda. Maybe I should say the all the combinatorial data is already out in, in there with lambda. So you don't need to. Um, yeah, questions about this particular aspect. Well, I just mean like, how do you draw an algebraic variety? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. this is an algebraic variety. Right. Yeah, it's just some boundary. yeah, some boundary. Yeah, off to infinity. But, you know, typical algebraic varieties. This is not. Yeah, it's nothing to do with the initial knot. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Okay. So once you're at this point, you might get hopeful. I did to say, well, maybe. The classification problem that I'm trying to understand here can be translated into a purely algebraic classification problem. Namely, all I need to tell myself is count how many toric charts like this do I have. And these are the toric charts with this system of coordinates. Those are called cluster charts or cluster seeds. And you can ask, given a cluster algebra, how many cluster seeds do I have? And good news for me, like 22 years of math before me, like tell you a lot of things about this. So in some cases, you get some nice finite numbers like Catalan numbers. Uh, and in some cases, you get infinitely many, but they have very interesting combinatorics. Um, so, you know, for means Zalavinsky and then a whole school of people have developed this theory quite a lot. And now this was the first brick in connecting symplectic topology, this particular problem in 4D symplectic topology, to the theory of cluster algebras. And now what has happened in the last like two, three years is kind of using this kind of bridge. I have a symplectic problem. I go to the cluster algebra setting, try to leverage results known in there, and then go and show that I have many fillings, for instance. Uh, conversely, this has been very useful the other way. So there were a few problems in cluster algebras that were open, they just didn't know. Like for instance, construct an algebra, a cluster algebra structure in a Richardson variety or compute, show that something has a Donaldson-Thomas invariant, a Donaldson-Thomas automorphism. Say, for instance, if you took uh, the Muller spire twist, it was not known that the Muller spire twist in positroids um, was a cluster automorphism. And you can prove that by going to the symplectic side, realizing it as some symmetry of the knot, telling you that that is Donaldson Thomas, and then therefore that's a cluster automorphism. So I don't know, there's like now uh, three or four papers kind of doing that, like using this bridge to go from cluster algebra to symplectic and like getting answers from one to the other. So that, that's been pretty useful so far. Um, but going back to the specific classification of fillings, you can now ask, will it be true that fillings up to Hamiltonian isotopy are in bijection with cluster seeds? Okay, well, any bijection has two pieces, surjection and injection. Okay, so uh, good news, surjectivity theorem. Yes? Intuitively, yes. So take this guy, okay. Now, a neighborhood, there's a theorem called uh, the tubular neighborhood theorem, Weinstein neighborhood theorem that says around a Lagrangian, an, an open neighborhood of it will be symplectomorphic to the cotangent bundle. So, in particular, you can draw nearby Lagrangians by taking graphs of one forms. So, that's roughly what this is saying. It's like you could take, a, if you think of this as a Duram group, you could take a one form and kind of push it a bit into that direction and try to like create another Lagrangian that way. So this is also 
Yeah, exactly, exactly, yes. So you could say, I have this one with this kind of, this would be like a non-exact deformation, or I instead take this one with the local system pushed forward by this deformation. And so now I keep the same Lagrangian, but I've changed the, the local system according to this. So I, I was giving you a geometric description of the deformation so that the new local system is just a push forward. But of course, you can just keep the same Lagrangian and like change the local system according to that. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So surjectivity so theorem. So this, this was this is this is very recent, like last summer. Um, um, every cluster seed comes from a Lagrangian filling. So every yeah. So yeah. So uh, yeah, I, I failed because there's like so many. Uh, so this is a talk about probably. There's six paper quest. Yeah. I moved yeah. Sorry. I, I asked, but I moved out of Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's fine. I, I think it's about six papers. So I'm, I'm, I'm telling a narrative. Um, the first paper that started this story is a paper with Hong Hao Gao that established the first examples of Lagrangians with infinitely many Lagrangian fillings. Then there came a paper with Eric Zaslow. What that did was develop the foundational methods called weaves that allow you to study these things. That's going to come in part two. Like, how, how do you construct these guys? How do you actually build these guys? So on and so forth. And then with Dapping Wang, we proved the case where betas are of the form beta times delta, where delta is like a lift of the Coxeter, uh, sorry, of the W naught element, the longest element in this metric group. And then with Eugene Gorski, Misha Gorski, and uh, Jose Cimental, we wrote two papers developing technical machinery mostly. And then a third paper with them and Lin Huishen and Ian Le, finally establishing the existence theorem. And then last uh, summer, we wrote this paper with Hong Hao Gao. And then in the fall, we wrote two more papers, one with Melissa Sherman Bennett and Ian Le, proving applications to this Donaldson and Muller Spire twist. So, hopefully have cited everybody but uh, it's a combination of papers um, right so every cluster and, and yeah i mean i'm, I'm the I'm, I'm an author in all of them i guess but, okay every cluster seat in this model i space comes from a lagrangian filling Okay, is, is the statement uh, clear? So you compute the algebra of regular functions, you prove it's a cluster algebra. Now, by some algebraic method, you end up saying, I have seat over here, some toric chart. I have no idea whether a Lagrangian exists that gives me this toric chart. Theorem, yes, you do. There's actually one way of obtaining this Lagrangian film on, on how to do this. Okay, so. Now, some quick comments, and then I'll start to give you intuition for all these kind of things. And if anybody here is familiar with wall crossing and, and things like that, you're going to start to see all that arising in this problem, even it might not look like there's wall crossing going on. So uh, a few remarks. So remark number one. The construction of these Lagrangian fillings So in particular of these fillings with infinitely many uh, uses weaves. So this is, this is, this has its own paper. This was developed um, with Eric Daslow. And what weaves are, are a diagrammatic calculus. So this is a diagrammatic calculus and I'll essentially spend the whole of part two of this talk talking about this, a diagrammatic calculus. If you've ever seen circle calculus as developed by Ben Elias and, and Jordi Williamson, very much looked like circle calculus for a reason um, that allows you to construct Lagrangians and perform all sorts of operations, Hamiltonian isotopies, Lagrangian surgeries. I'll tell, I'll tell you what that is, through these diagrams. So a geometrically initially challenging problem, you need to build Lagrangian surfaces in 4D, now gets translated, not translated, but you can access part of it thanks to that. So uh, the weaves is sort of the, the key idea using these particular types of fronts and maybe, yeah, I sometimes forget, like you should absolutely stop me and say like, how does this relate to X on Y? 
So maybe I should say you should you want to think of these as fronts, like wave fronts, for the real part, for the real part of an holomorphic spectral curve. So if you've attended the discussion a couple of hours, three hours before the talk, it was all about like spectral curves and like whatever, BPS state and everything. Where are they? Well, that picture is what motivated this kind of more topological Betty-like picture where there's none of that. But these weaves, what they're going to be is you take your spectral curve, really an holomorphic curve inside of the cotangent bundle, you now take a real part of your holomorphic symplectic form, that spectral curve becomes a real Lagrangian. And now you say, or I say, this is a two-dimensional surface in 4D. I have no idea how to draw it. But if it is exact, and if it's not exact, there's a twig for that. What you can do is you can lift it to R5. That sounds like a stupid move. And then do something. So here's the idea. Maybe this is a nice, nice engineering trick. Or this, this Lagrangian locally is what? So you have these coordinates, right? You have like Q1, Qn, and then you have like P1 and Pn, right? And you have like so, some equation for, for this Lagrangian. So now what you do is you introduce an extra variable z, which what it is, it's the integral of the real form. And this is like the integrals of like Pi dQi, so the sum of all of them. Now what I claim is, if this guy was Lagrangian, so you have a Lagrangian in these coordinates, you can lift it by doing this to something called a Legendrian in dimension one more. So you started in two n dimensions. Now you go up to two n plus one, pretty stupid move. But now the advantage, if I now project down to Q1, Qn, Z, and this is the beauty of this. Now this is n plus one coordinates. That recovers everything else. So it recovers the whole picture. Okay, let me run this by you in 1D. It won't do much. And then in 2D, and it does a lot. So suppose I have a Lagrangian in R2. That is a one-dimensional guy in R2, Q1, P1. Now, suppose it's exact. So you take the integral of the form in bound zero area. So think about like a big eight like that with the same area on both sides. Now, I introduce a Z. So now this lifts to a Lagrangian knot, a knot in R3. That's some not in R3. Okay, that looks harder to visualize than a plane curve. And now I project down to QZ. So my new variables are not Q and P, but are Q and the integral of P to Q. Great. So now you've changed the 2D problem of a curve, but now you have some other curve in, in 2D, right? The good thing is this curve over here won't have this kind of weird immersion points, but it will have cusps. So, you know, it's not a big change. But now run these in two dimensions in four. Suppose I have a Lagrangian surface in 4D. That's Q1, Q2, P1, P2. I go up to R5, Q1, Q2, P1, P2, and Z, the integral of the PI dQi. And now I forget about it. So now I'm down to R3, Q1, Q2, and Z. So the punchline of this is you can draw legitimately, visually, in a mathematical rigorous way, Lagrangians in 4D by drawing surfaces in R3. The surfaces are the projection here, and this Q1, Q2 integral of the Liouville form will entirely recover by taking the slope. How do you recover P1? You take partial Q1 of Z. How do you recover P2? You take partial Q2 of Z. I mean, this is like a fundamental theorem of calculus applied to this, right? Or whatever that, that theorem is. Does that make sense? There's a, there's a downside. I don't want to sell that this is like the golden goose. The downside is this was a smooth and embedded People like smooth and embedded. You go up to our files, still smooth and embedded. You project the wave front. If you've ever looked at like, you know, the, the mug of coffee in the morning with a light, the way light refracts, wave fronts are not smooth. They have singularities, they have caustics. Like that's not how the Huygens principle works. So the downside is this wave front down here is going to have plenty of singularities. So you either get scared because, you know, they're spiky and you don't know what to do, or you go and read you know, the fantastic Russian school books of Arnold and Verchenko and everything where they classify all of those, you know, after a year or two, you've mastered those guys and you know how to manipulate it. So now you're super happy. So that, that's mostly what happened for me. I was said, I'm okay with singularities as long as I can see them with my eyes in R3. So that is sort of really what's behind all of that is this spectral curve that I struggle a lot understanding 
because their surfaces in 4D, what I always do is I always look at the front in R3, which have a lot of singularities, swallow tails, D4 minuses, D4 plus, but once you've understood those singularities, then you can prove a lot of theorems with them. Um, so that's, that's really what's, what's going behind these kind of constructions. And that's what weaves are, are a systematic calculus axiomatizing these kind of things. And the second thing is surjectivity is proven by introducing a new potential which generalizes many known potentials due to Allegretti, for Goncharov and company. Um, and this is, I, I don't know if it's, this one is not super, no? Like, anyway, what I, I never know. It's equivalent with potential. It has nothing to do with, it's, it's also denoted W. It has nothing to do with your landau ginzburg potential, okay? Not as far as I know. Okay, um, so this quiver with potential, QW, um, is what allows you to prove this kind of thing. And both the definition of this potential in the Betty site is, is entirely new. It, it counts certain kind of polygons and, and you prove that it really captures all the geometry. And, and then you prove the key result in here is you prove something called rigidity. So you prove, you prove that it's the trace of its if it's a uh, deformation space is trivial which ends up implying that you can mutate forever so how do you access this guy you start as far away as you want because you've proven this kind of results which is what we do in our paper you can go 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 forever algebraically and what our paper tells you is every time you can mutate algebraically you can mutate geometrically like very naively this is i know this is my kind of dream where I have algebra that tells me what to do, and then you prove a result that every time you do something algebraically, like a cluster mutation or like a quiver mutation, you have a statement that says geometrically you can realize both sides in it in a bijection way. Does that make sense? Like I mutate the quiver algebraically theorem, you can actually find a Lagrangian after that realizes the new cluster chart. Yeah. It means that it's It means that the, that, that the trace of its deformation space is trivial. What, what it means in practice is that, is that you can mutate forever and there's never two cycles in the reduced part of the quiver. Quiver with potential. So I remember that for a quiver with potential, you have this splitting theorem where the reduced part and the trivial part. Like you can start to mutate, 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 mutate. You might get worried, this is the bygone problem, that you eventually have a quiver with potential with a bygone, sorry, with, with like a two cycle. In the standard for Minza-Levinsky theory without the W, that's never a problem because you kill these two cycles by fiat. But in, in this setup, which is what arises geometrically, that corresponds geometrically to this bygone. And so if the reduced part of the quiver after many mutations has a bygone, it means you have a bygone you cannot kill geometrically. So then you cannot mutate there anymore. So you cannot do Lagrangian this surgery anymore. So rigidity implies what's called non-degeneracy, and non-degeneracy is what I just told you. Rigidity is like a slight enhancement of that. Um, that is kind of, okay. Any questions at this point? Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what's going on. <laughs> yes. So the way to construct this these charts. Um, that this is the first step, right? Like, how do you even construct a toric chart? You, you shift quantize. Now, then the question is, how do you build these variables A1, A2, G? And that's going to be some kind of what we call microlocal marodromies, so kind of relative cycles where you transport microlocal parallel transport. And in the second step, you also use the shift quantization by using the microlocal parallel transport. And then you microlocal parallel transport the decoration at this end of the relative cycle to the other, and then you quotient. And you can ask me, why didn't you just take monodromies? And my answer is because Eric and his co-authors did in 2016 and it doesn't work. Because the monodromies are rational functions, but they're not regular. So I knew it couldn't be monodromies. And then like, what else? And the, the short answer is it's the Poincaré duals of the monodromies. So instead of taking the absolute cycles, you take Poincaré duals and then you define these relative holonomies, microlocal holonomies. All right, any questions at this stage? Keep going. 
Yeah, so you're, you're well, I have prepared a lot of like information, but um, you're welcome to tell me whether you're more interested in hearing more about this side of the story or you're comfortable sort of moving towards the weave and spectral network business. So I, I won't cold call you, but you're welcome to shout at me. So let's try to understand this with uh, business a little bit. So weaves. So these are going to be diagrams in R2 with certain decorations that represent fronts in R3 and the picture you want to have in mind is such a diagram will roughly be the information of a particular kind of trivalent graph or embedding of a bunch of a trivalent graph so it for instance will look something like that something of that sort that's that's an example of a weave so this is what a weave looks like I'll, I'll explain what this means so this is a weave and again this is in r2 okay what r2 is it so this is a weave in the r2 given by coordinates q1 and q2 all right so what this weave is representing is a front in R3. So this is some surface in R3 that its projection to the z-axis is exactly this one. So this gives a Lagrangian surface. So if we call this with with W, um, this represents a certain surface. Let's say lambda W as a front. Oh, okay, this is a this is a function in R5 whose front. is given by the lifting of this w okay and then from here you now project down to the z coordinate so this has coordinates q1 q2 p1 p2 and z the front was inside of r3 q1 q2 and z and it was if I draw here, for instance, it, it has some sheets. So above every point here, there's going to be three sheets if there's two colors. So these are labeled by permutations as one, as two, as one. So you use two colors to not have to label everything. So in general, to give a weave, you start by giving a natural number. So this is very similar. It literally in the Gajoro Mornitsky story corresponds to you give the rank. So you say, I'm working in SLN. And SLN means you take the coxeter, sorry, you take the vial group, so that's a coxeter projection. In this case, it's just a symmetric group. So it's n minus one generators. So this will be S S3. So this would, would correspond to an SL3 weave. So if I now project down to Q1, Q2, P1, P2 of this guy, now I get an exact. So this is a Lagrangian filling. And this claims that this is inside of R4. And this is a Lagrangian filling. Of and now I, ch I need to choose the braid beta, right? So this is the braid beta in my box, and I'll tell you exactly what the braid beta is. In this case, braid beta is exactly you go around here and you read all that you see. So you read sigma one, sigma two, sigma one, sigma two, sigma one, two, one, two. So here I just read literally sigma one, sigma two. That's sigma one, sigma two with colors to the fourth. And if you change the asymptotics, then you change the, the braid. 
So again, here you see literally how the asymptotics given the braid word is literally giving just the ends of this diagram. And then weaves are about legitimate ways to fill this diagram so that you get an embedded exact Lagrangian filling in here. And you could say, well, there's so many ways, you know, I could now go and do a bubble. So for instance, I could have the following asymptotics. I could have, so let's do n equals two case. I could have just sigma one to the five. So my asymptotics are going to be something like, let's, let's do this, these are my asymptotics. And you can say, how could you possibly like, deal with that? Like these are like all, in particular, uh, maybe I haven't told you, I allow trivalent vertices. So now it looks like all possible trivalent vertices, uh, trivalent graphs. So for instance, you could say, well, look, I choose this one, this one in here, this one in here, and this one in here. But like, why not this one? And the answer is, we prove, this is in the paper with Eric, that in order to get embedded exact Lagrangian, you need to have a specific number of trivalent vertices. So if you want this to be embedded, the number of trivalents are constrained, and that exactly tells you this becomes a combinatorially tack tackable problem. So in particular, there's a Catalan number worth of trees like that that you can draw. So for two and torus links, you would expect a Catalan number of fillings, which coincides with the number of clusters in the, in the AN type case. So that would be like a picture in this case. And again, the, the asymptotics is giving this data at the boundary. And the filling is about all the ways that you can do that. Now, let's look at that. It's a pretty natural operation on trivalent graph, which is you go from having this picture to having this picture, right? The good thing is that is going to be a whiff way, a diagrammatic way to represent Lagrangian this surgery. So actually the Lagrangian filling represented by this graph and the one represented by doing the whitehead move are different. They're going to be different. How do you distinguish that? Well, you can either use the Lagrangian DGA or as he was saying, you can also show that the two shift quantizations are different. So you literally show those shifts are not the same. They don't even represent the same chart in the modelized space. So, so, so you're done. So again, the message here is you want to draw a surface embedded in 4D. Instead, you realize that surface as the projection of a surface embedded in 5D. But the advantage is that surface in 5D, by virtue of being Legendrian, can be entirely recovered by having Q1, Q2, and Z. So that ends up being a surface in R3. And now this surface in R3, I'm not going to take it to be arbitrary. I'm going to take it to be very special. That's exactly this thing in purple. I'm only going to take fronts coming from real part of holomorphic Legendrian singularities. And that tells me that the only singularities that I have are these trivalent vertices. This is a type of singularity called D4 minus. And then these are A1 cube singularities. So these are three planes in space intersecting. Like X1 equals 0, X2 equals 0, and X3 equals 0. So in this case, the criteria is no bubbles, like literally like a tree. And the general case, I have a combinatorial criteria, but it's not written anywhere. It's, there's, a, yeah, there's, a, there's a version of, so here one way to say it is there's no bubbles like this, right? Or no, no closed faces, because this wouldn't be allowed either. There would be a rep cord in the middle, right? So there's a notion of what a face, a closed face looks like here. And you know, it's, it's not this, like. This is not a closed face. There's no rep cord here. And the reason is because the slopes, it's three sheets. So you have enough liberty. There, if you just have two sheets and they have to close, at some point you got it, right? But if you have three of them and one like intersects the other, so that's not a closed face. But there's a definition of something, I, I can define for you what's a closed face, and then the answer is it's embedded if and only if it has no closed faces. So that's, uh, yeah. So I'm having a little trouble realizing what the fronts correspond to Okay, let's draw. Yeah, let's draw them. Okay, that's a that's a good good point to discuss. So let me start with. So I'm not going to draw the following, but if n is given to you, what goes above a point is just going to be n disks. So n disjoint disks. So above a point where there's no funny blue or you know there i just put n disks okay okay so now first question is 
n is a number that is given to you and it's going to correspond it's a number of sheets above here minus one like the colors are the generators of the symmetric group of n elements so it suffices to take n minus one transpositions um, in the Gallardo Mornites history, th that n really is the SLN like that you're using to do non-evangelization with like GLN local systems or SLN local systems. So let's think about this guy first. And maybe that's, that's the thing that we really want to focus for now. So when I draw this, what does this mean? So, and let's for now think n equals two. So above this point, there's two sheets. So here, when I try to draw this in 2D, Above this point, I see two sheets. There's like two sheets like that. Okay, so I'm gonna try to draw it, and then uh, we discuss like a formula for it, or you know how do you get it yourself if you forget. Um, so I'm gonna try to draw it first. Okay, I don't know if this helps at all, but here's here's an exercise you can do. Take a sheet of paper, okay? And now put a second sheet of paper above it. Okay, so maybe if I draw it horizontally, you take two sheets of papers, like one above the other, okay? And now you literally, along three edges, you squish them. Like I, yeah, you sew it together in this direction, in this direction, in this direction. And now you go and go in this side, and that's gonna open like flip, right? It's gonna open like flip, flip, flip. That's what this is. So topologically, it is the cone over like sigma one cube in the sense that I take the braid where it intersects three times and then I just like do that. Like that. So that's what it is topologically. Well, I mean, in R5, they're not intersecting. Yeah. <laughs> like, in R4, they're not intersecting either. Like in R3, yeah, these are like intersections like that. And then here something happens, which is this D4 minus. Does that make sense? Okay, so you could ask why three and not seven? Why am I not allowing seven vertices? Like, sorry, it says seven valency. And the answer is if you do three, this guy is embedded and smooth. If you do more than three, this guy is singular. So it's what I'm trying to say is the combinatorics are capturing something subtle. So there's like papers and computations about why is this picture allowed and say four vertices is not allowed. And the answer is four verses will give you a single legend, which you can study, but that's another story. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. You go to Arnold Varchenko. Yes. So, like, b before I was doing this stuff, right, I was doing like higher dimensional Kirby calculus and stuff like that. And I knew all the higher dimensional fronts. So it's like Solitaire, the AD4 plus purses, so on and so forth. It, it's, it's challenging, right? Like having a Swallowtail going through a cast. These are real co dimension one singularities. Um, and these ones, these are not even generic singularities. They appear in the Arnold and company books as perestroikas of singularities, as Rodemeister moves through surfaces. So the generic deformation for this guy, it's very nice. It has three swallowtails, one here, one here, and one here. So this never appears in the book as a singularity of a Legendrian front because generically it isn't. It is only generic as an holomorphic Legendrian singularity. So what's going on here? Like you can take C with a complex complex numbers and take the first jet space. These as a contact topologies, I really enjoyed because I, you know, they always sell you the, the real picture, but this perfectly works great in holomorphic. So what is this? This is the cotangent bundle of C with complex coordinate Z. Let me put here W the coordinate for the fiber and then times C and let me put this co coordinate like U, right? The contact form here is DZ minus, uh, sorry, it's du minus wdz, right? There's a very nice guy here, which is if you're just in the zw direction, this is complex. You have this kind of picture, right? Where you have like w square equals z. This is a nice holomorphic Lagrangian in the cotangent bundle. When you take its Legendrian leaf to the one jet space, what you get is a cubic, it's a cuspidal thing. So when, this is the same as in the real picture. This is in the ZU, you get cubical. And the reason is U is, you know, what's happening? U is the integral of W dZ, right? But W is the integral of square Z dZ. So the integral of this looks like Z to the cube divided by two. 
So z to the cube divided by two equals z. If you put the two to the other side, is z, uh, you know, square equals u cube. Sorry, u square equals z cube. Okay. Anyway, so you get a cusp, but this is a, this is an holomorphic cusp. When you take the real part of this picture, when now you take the real holomorphic, the real part of this holomorphic contact form, that's what gets you this guy. And my point is, this is a generic holomorphic Legendrian singularity. You cannot make it disappear by an holomorphic perturbation. But once you take its real part, this guy, that's no way real generic. And how do I know that? Because real generic Legendrian singularities have codimension one. I think of a cusp edge. Here, the codimensions of the singularities is real too. So certainly, the moment I perturb, swallowtails should appear. And they do appear, and three of them appear, and so on and so forth. Is it? Sorry. Go ahead. Anything else? Um, yeah. yeah. So, 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 I don't know. I, I, I started doing that because David Truman like, and Eric were doing something kind of similar to that. And I mean, they were studying this model through, this, through these pictures. And my first question is, what happens if you put W to the N, which is like N thing, and it doesn't work, and so on and so forth. But so th that is kind of the motivation. But once you're in this setting, you can use this kind of singularities to build things. And uh, so this is the local model uh, for this. And then for the other one, so this is the local model number one. Is that a better, you get a better visual sense of that? And then, sorry? Yeah. R3. So if you look at this guy from above, that's the Q1, Q2 plane. So when I draw a, a trivalent here, that's Q1, Q2. The Z direction is like where the sheets live. So it is genuinely like Q1, Q, Q2, Z, like a real three dimensional space. But the singularities are so, so simple that it suffices to look at them from above and I don't need to remember the Z coordinate. If you ever study a, a generic real front in 3D, you cannot just forget the Z coordinate because there's tons of swallowtails around and you don't know who goes above and who goes below. But for these kind of fronts coming from these holomorphic guys, that's, that's the beauty. You can kind of forget about them. And so this is one of the local models and the, lo the other local model is, is this thing. And sorry, it's, it's much nicer. <laughs> so let me tell you why I really like these local models, uh, especially if, if you're trying to talk to algebra people, you know, do braid theory or things like that. Suppose that what I start above is my braid beta. So suppose that I have a braid beta given to me. So this is beta, and here beta we chose. You know, it was like sigma one, sigma two, sigma one, sigma two, sigma one. And then down here, you're always going to have like, it's them as your product, which is W naught. So these are the asymptotics, which for now you just think is some braid beta given to you and you want to simplify them. What is this telling you at the level of algebra? This move, it's telling you that you can go from sigma one square down to sigma one. Right? Like here I see asymptotics for sigma one, sigma one, and the answer is instead of doing asymptotic for sigma one square, you just go down to sigma one. What is this guy? Maybe this is more familiar. So if this is sigma one, sigma two, and sigma one. Oh, I flipped everything. What is this guy? Great. The master three move. Great. So this is sometimes called the Neil Hecke move or disappears a lot in, in Hecke algebras, but I, I can tell you why another time. Um, but the point is, given any braid beta, a nice exercise for you in algebra, given any braid beta, you can use these two moves to always bring it down to its Demeser product. So in particular, to a permutation. Does that make sense? So the point is, if I have a, an asymptotic condition given by beta, then I can use these moves to go down until I hit W naught and uh, lemma that you prove once you hit W naught you can this is a Lagrangian cobordism and then you can fill it with disks down at the bottom so now you've built a Lagrangian filling of course there's not a unique choice there's many choices of which sequence you use in there so now yeah 
Sorry? Yeah, so what I'm saying is like once you've arrived at this not at the boundary, this is just an unlink. So then each component will be bounding a Lagrangian disk. Does that make sense? Um, so, okay, so the advantage is now you have these pictures, your asymptotic condition was given here at the start, and now you use these kind of pictures, which are depicting fronts for you, so as to draw fronts for a Lagrangian filling in R4, and once you go down to W0, you close up this Lagrangian filling, then you're done. So that is a sort of quote unquote wealth of diagrammatic ways of constructing Lagrangian fillings. Because there's different choices. Like for instance, in here, if you have blue, 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 I could have gone like this first and then this, versus I could have gone like first let's do these two, and then I do this last one. So these two are not the same Lagrangian filling, they literally differ by this move. And you can prove that they, again, the shift quantizations are different, so on and so forth. Um, a second advantage, I'm not gonna delve into that more, but a second advantage is the shift quantization is really easy once you have this picture, which is you describe the model I of shifts here as being some flux given in this space such that the transversality condition is given by this. And then the chart, the TL chart associated to this weave, so in particular, it has a TL chart in the model I space. I should draw this orange was the model of the space color. So this gives a TL chart inside of M, M lambda. This TL chart is literally just given by some transversality conditions in here. Okay, so it, it's, it's not, I mean, it is some math problem, but it's not terribly challenging. Okay, so this is the setup. So you develop a calculus. I'm not going to give you all the pictures. You can go to the paper, but there's a, you know, tables, a few tables of diagrams telling you these moves are allowed and these moves are not allowed. For instance, the candy move is pretty nice. So every time you had a picture like that, what do you think? Should these two Lagrangians, so if I see a, a piece of a Lagrangian like this one, and I instead substitute it by this, should this be an interesting move or not? No. It shouldn't, because what you're doing is you're doing a rather Meister 3 and then you're undoing it. Pretty stupid thing to do. It shouldn't give you anything, and it doesn't give you anything. So these are actually isomorphic. Whereas again, these two are not isomorphic. These are mutations happening. So you have a table of moves saying these kind of things allowed Hamiltonian isotopy, these kind of things different, but they differ by what's, what's called surgery. Yeah. You mentioned that the uh, uh, feeling, so you have a, a disk with boundaries, so the Lagrange is living on a boundary. And yeah. In, in, Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you're producing sheaves, the sheaves are living in R3, right? Sheaves living in R3. With, uh, well, that's, yeah, that's if you want to quantize the filling, yes. Uh, okay. Um, and, and is it possible to get sheaves living in R2 by? Like previously, you told us about the shift R2. Yeah. Yeah. Is it possible to get shift R2? So this has not really been explored much. One thing that you could do naively from an algebraic viewpoint is I won't have shifts of vector spaces. I'll have like a sheaf of flags or something and try to do it in that language. Maybe. What I actually think does work is something I've discussed with uh, Merlin Christ because he has uh, papers in that, which is, this is a four, I mean, okay, let's go to the, this is sorry for people who were not previous to the talk, but this is a 4D picture, right? So you should be able to have a, a 6D picture, and instead of computing here, compute everything with coefficients in the shepherd, it's like some sheaf of categories, and then you could do what you're saying. So there should be a way to push this down to the plane as much as possible, but instead of computing with a sheaf of complexes of vector spaces, you would compute with a sheaf of categories. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, you can do that. I mean, that that is that is shift sub lambda, right? 
No, like, I mean, in this question, what would you do? You would do, the, the, the now would be like this, no? Like, it would just like, be like something like of this sort. Right? Like, like you've perturbed in this way. And now sheaves are going to be like 0, C, C square, and all the maps here. But these maps, if I just look at the boundary, if, if I just look at sheaf lambda without looking at the filling, these are just five maps such that these, you know, consecutively different transfers. What the extra information tells you is, for instance, it will tell you, so let's take this guy and this guy, right? This will tell you that this map and this map, because they differ by this, those two also need to be different. So you see, like you, you first have a boundary condition, which is like all, all tuples of flags that satisfy this and that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, all right, good. Okay, so let's connect this to, to Morse flow trees and spectral networks, and then you can ask me questions. Yeah. Uh, the short answer is implicitly we we could be, but um, so yeah. So David Truman wrote a pretty nice paper about exit path categories, and indeed you can think about those particular categories of constructible shift with singular superposition and say no, no, I'm going to rephrase everything as some quiver with relations and exit path categories and approach it from that perspective. That is the way you prove a lot of the local models, saying what are shifts uh, in that local model. Well, you know, you write in sort of some form of quiver where you say that's, you know, I have the quiver associated to the strata and the inclusion of the strata and their closures, that's the quiver itself and you have all these relations and then you prove that that's all there is, right? So in the technical ends of the proof, that's, that's exactly how you prove what are shifts there. You, you do it with exit path sort of models. But yeah, after that, I, <laughs> I use that as a you know, off the shelf tool all right so now uh, everything i've said so far you know in one way or another i can make rigorous and precise is either in the literature or we can make it be in the literature uh in, in a rigorous math setting and and now i'm going to start to go into the still mathy but towards dreamy world of how does this connect to spectral networks and and so forth which in, in some cases n equals two n equals three we, we can make precise so here's the idea, is that now you want to do floor theory on weaves, meaning you want to take exactly... Can you just before you go on, yeah. an example of the with potential for your like, I don't know, the unknown. Yeah, so any two enters link, the quiver is just going to be a straight thinking diagram AN quiver. How about two enters link? Yeah. And that particular potential is zero because there's no cycles. Uh, so, so they're just a single arrow? Yeah, uh -huh. that's the two enters knot. In general, if you have a, any algebraic link, like, like a torus knot or something like that, like if you just think of the crossings as like bricks like this, there's, there's something called the brick diagram. And the quiver is just given by, you put, you put a, a vertex inside of every brick, and then the arrows go like, like this, like kind of for, for every three of them, you put it like a triangle here and you put another triangle here, another triangle here, and you cancel them the other way. Does that make sense? Yeah, so here, so this we prove with Hohao, the potential is all, all of these little triangles in, in, in this particular case. But in general, you might have things that are not triangles. Yeah. The, 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 in my paper with Hohao, we've completely worked out the Plavik fence case, which includes this. So there you can see the quiver. It, and it's the same as the kind of the brick quiver you would, you would in topology. So you would take a cipher surface and there's a particular basis whose H1 intersection would give you that. Um, and I'm writing a paper with Misha Korsky, sort of you were generalizing to things that are not plavic fences, but um, pretty plavic graphs, positroids, so on. Okay, so floor theory and weaves. What is, what is the, the floor theoretic setup here? So we have our lambda. And as I said, there's this A lambda, this is a Legendre DGA, DG algebra. And you know, in, in the specific setup we're in, I'm gonna think of lambda as being given by this data, like this kind of data where I have like, so now my lambda has now become 
like this particular kind of diagram because that's representing my braid like sigma one sigma two sigma one sigma two sigma one sigma two now i want to have a filling of that so now i go and i have a filling of that so i have a filling i fill a filling l with partial l equals lambda filling lagrangian filling and that we do by doing a weave so again maybe picture of that sword yeah i simplify these two i do a rather master three here i put in here so on and you can continue the weave any way you want and you keep going down so on and so forth you can okay so that l is encoded in this data the, the, the Legendrian is this slice. L is all the inside. So now, how do you compute the Legendrian DG algebra? Well, it's going to be some expression in terms of these guys, which, as I said before, roughly speaking, that DG algebra is the causal resolution associated to the brain matrices for that. So that's, I'm not going to tell you more about it unless you ask, but that's something you compute out of matrices. You associate a matrix to here, here. So there's a rep chord. Maybe I should say this closely. You can make it so that there's a rep chord to the left of every crossing. So you make it be like that, and then every rep chord gets a variable, and then you take the path matrix associated to all those variables according to the algebra, and then some of the, the principal minors of those essentially give you this DG algebra. Now, question if I have the filling, what do I gain? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's it's you always kind of compact you compactify. But when you do the minus one closure, because there's a W naught implicit in every twist, no disks ever go that way. So when you're computing the DGA for this with a delta and a delta, no disks ever escape on the sides. So for all intents and purposes, I don't need to be drawing all the time like this because there's nothing that's going to go around like that. Yeah, in J1 of S1, yeah. Yeah, this is like, the, 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 the general picture, my paper with Eric, it's stated like that, like, this is in J1 of S1, and this is in J1 of, of D2. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, if lambda, my asymptotics, gives you a DGA, what does a Lagrangian filling give me? Answer, a map down to, essentially, well, you can even put pi one, but it gives you a map down to here. Okay. So now the question is, how do you compute that map? And that map is often denoted epsilon lambda. And in floor theory, what this map does is as follows. Epsilon L of a rep chord A. So A is a rep chord. So this is a rep chord, which in our picture, they always lie on the left. This is equal to... Maybe I should write it here. It's the sum over, and now you go with allomorphic disks that, sorry, allomorphic strips that start at A. So this is my A. And now they go inside of my Lagrangian. So it's a rep chord that starts here, and then it's an allomorphic strip that's going to go inside, go around, and then somewhere in the Lagrangian. So this is what we mean by allomorphic, uh, by floor theory in this setting. The way you define this map is often called the augmentation, is you sum over these allomorphic strips, and then you keep track of the boundary, of the boundary of the strip as an homology class. And of course, if you want to close it up, you need some capping path choices, but that's, that's what it is. So let me give you a, does, does this make sense so far? So if you've understood floor theory in the Lagrangian setting, the way you define, uh, say, the differential of something is you count allomorphic strips with some positive and negative puncture somewhere. Here, once you have a filling, what you do is you fix the rep core and ask for allomorphic strips with one sole positive puncture. So these are things that are maps you from, you know, a disk with a unique positive puncture inside of my r4 with the boundary on l 
and such that the asymptotic of this positive puncture is exactly blowing up to a rep chord. Okay, so this particular count, you know, gram of compactness, so on, this ends up being a finite number of monomials. So this gives you some polynomial on this group ring. Yeah, like the, the way it's done, it's relative homology, but then what you can do is choose the so-called capping path in here. So you can just choose a, a generic point in here, connect everything down to that, and that gives you then an absolute cycle. That's what happens if you want to like pi one of L, which some people want to do. All right, this is the way, there's this is a way to define a map. And, and, and the point I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make here is that this is some count of holomorph or J holomorphic strips. So th this map must satisfy del bar u equals zero. And again, my limited brain says, this is a surface in 4D, hard for me to visualize. Even harder, it is for me to visualize holomorphic strips in 4D, too much. Luckily for me, Tobias Eckholm had developed something called Morse flow trees. So there's a way to take a limit Some, some people write adiabatic limit for these guys into something called Morse flow trees. The upshot of Tobias's paper is that one can both limit holomorphic strips to a combinatorial object called Morse flow trees that I'll explain in a minute. And conversely, you can glue. Given a Morse flow tree picture, you can ensure that it comes from a unique holomorphic strip. So roughly speaking, there's a bijection. It's much more subtle than that, but once the analysis is done, instead of counting J holomorphic strips in 4D, you can count more flow trees in the front in 3D. Okay, let me show you what a more flow tree looks like, and then you might start to see the Gajero Morinitsky kind of pictures appear. So, what is a more flow tree? I'm going to give you an example in dimension one, and then we're going to go up in dimension two. And the punchline, maybe I should just give the punchline and you can ask later too, is if I am to draw all the Morse flow trees here, you're going to end up with some diagram naturally named after in floor theory. So I'm going to count these Morse flow trees. That diagram is a spectral network as defined by Kyoto Mornitsky, meaning it's a certain set of one dimensional intervals that satisfy certain interactions. And it's a statement that their guys behave exactly the same as of Tobias's guys. So like the analytic part of the paper that's to come is to say the theory of Morse flow trees coincides with the theory of WKB lines because this analysis. And the analysis is roughly, you look at the ODEs and you see they are quote unquote the same. Yeah. Yeah. So this is, this is more flow trees in 3D, where 3D is the front for the Legendrian lift of the Lagrangian L. <laughs> Sorry, this is always so. This is a knot in 3D. This is a surface in 4D. One way to deal with this surface in 4D is to lift it to 5D and project down to 3D with the front projection. Yes, and what I'm saying is that that is in this limit a more slow tree in the front of the Lagrangian lift of the Lagrangian. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, what what does a more slow tree look like? So I'm gonna do first a toy a toy picture, like meaning a, a one the one D case, and maybe that helps towards the the, the one general case. So suppose I have a Lagrangian knot. Um, so suppose I have a Legendrian knot, and this this is genuinely a Legendrian knot. So this is a front in R two Q Z for Legendrian or lambda Legendrian in R three. So this is Q P Z now. So what you do is the following: is you take a function which locally defines this sheet as the graph of f1 locally defines this sheet as the graph of f2 and by definition 
a morse flow tree is a solution to the following so this is the base you would have here the base m so here m is r a morse flow tree what is what it's doing it are morse flow trajectories up here drawn in the base so what you do literally is the following is you study gamma pass from an interval 0 1 into my m such that the gradient of well, it's, it's, it's an integral trajectory for the minus the gradient of f1 f2 along gamma is is this intuitive enough for everybody ODEs? so what this is saying is take the difference of these sheets here and now try to minimize it so whatever ODE if I started here say my initial condition was this point how is this going to behave it's going to it's you know it's going to the derivative is minus the gradient so it's going to minimize that distance so the Morse flow tree would flow that way so this is going that way so in 1D Morse flow trees are pretty boring it's literally like calculus sequence that we teach to our undergrads right if, if the functions are approaching, you're going that way. If the functions go that way, you know, like, for instance, what is a Morse flow tree for this model? Uh, so here I would have, like, a critical point here, right? So a Morse flow tree would be something that's going to flow and hit the critical point. It's going to start here, and then it will hit, and it'll stop here. And once it's here, it doesn't want to do anything else, right? Because it's minimized it. So same around here. So this is, like, freshman undergrad calculus good so now you try to do it in 2d and that's where the fun really starts so say the base is r2 you now start to have like all sorts of behaviors and maybe the most interesting behavior is as follows so several options among them there's the following one uh, maybe I should always have said for people who know this stuff, I only count rigid Morse flow trees, things that come in parametric. There's a formula like a, like when you do standard floor theory, there's a virtual count and you always count rigid ones. So I'm just going to be discussing rigid ones here. I'm not going to discuss parametric families. So you can have three sheets above. So these are three sheets. And I obviously not fully horizontal, like with, with certain slopes. And you might have your guy starting here between three and, sorry, maybe I overdid it here, between sheets three and one. And the tree, so it's flowing that way. So down in the base, what the tree does is it's going that way. So claim the following is a rigid phenomena, which is the guy in the middle, this guy, the sheet that's in the middle at some point goes like, I'm here, don't ignore me, and suddenly it slices it into two pieces. One that goes that way, and the other that goes like this way. But these are like two different legs. So down in the tree, this looks, this is called a Y0 vertex, it looks like that. I'm sorry to have used, uh, I'm sorry to have used red, I don't mean it to be anything like that red. the sheets of the front so i'm just saying like suppose you have a front in r3 and at some point in the front you have three sheets like in here i had two but maybe i had like a third one up, up here like so like, suppose you have a front where you have three sheets then this kind of behavior is a rigid behavior like this does happen for a certain choice of metric j you see this thing just sort of suddenly splitting and then this has has options Sorry? Yeah, I mean, it's yeah, now it's like a PD or whatever. I mean, yeah. So you're finding embeddings of the interval, which obviously at some point it won't be an interval. It could be trees like that, so that um, into the base M flowing along. So locally between sheets two and three, now you're minimizing F3 minus F1. But at some point, like the interaction of F1, F2, and F3 is such that F1 and F2 and F2 and F3 interact so that that guy like breaks into two. I, I mean, th there's a choice of parameters. I'm, I'm hiding the J here. You know, if you modify the J, the splitting might happen before or after. I mean, the J is needed. 
you need a metric to even define the gradient. And again, this is a limit of holomorphic disks, not really normal. Yeah. Yeah, functions whose graph is the sheet locally. Yeah, exactly. Yes, so, okay, fine. This is a picture. Why would you ever care? Let me give you an example. So suppose you're in a weave. So this is used in weave. In weaves, these appear constantly. So if you're in a situation like that, or you're in a situation like that, so how do you compute the Morse flow trees here? So first claim, this is a series of analytic lemmas. First claim, if I have a rep core coming from here, there's a unique solution that hits this vertex, and that's it. Second, if I come from here, I can either hit this guy or continue going. These are several solutions. One of them goes across, just left to right. These also can go across. This guy can go across, but there's another one, which is this phenomena, which is this guy can also go here and then split into this guy and then, oh, it's roughly this guy and this guy. So there's also this splitting. Now, I don't know how much you've seen like Gayoro Mornitsky stuff, but there's like, I don't know, they just go on and on about, or I mean, it's a very nice paper. I don't mean to I degrade it up, but they, they really emphasize this so-called like soliton splitting, okay? What that is, once you understand it in the language of Morse flows trees, and this is, this is a conceptually very important to understand, it is not a Morse flow, a lot of people say, oh, it's a flow tree. It's not a flow tree. What it is, is the superposition of three different guys. This guy, this guy, and this guy. That's what's happening. When Gayoro Mornitsky draw a spectral network, they're not drawing a given trajectory with a given asymptotics. They're drawing all trajectories at once. And so the kind of one of the upshots of this paper I'm writing now will be, if you go and have a Lagrangian feeling like that, and now you go and compute all the Morse flow trees, all the things that could happen around here with all the possible bifurcations and everything, the kind of diagram that you get exactly satisfies the spectral network rules, uh, including this, and yeah. So is that a two sheets or three sheets picture? This is a three sheets picture, three sheets. Yeah, so this is a three sheets picture and this is a two sheets picture. So let me give you the hand wave, your reason why, you know, you could believe this is true. If you look at Kajoro Morinaitsky, what they're doing is they're taking the integral of like this cyber Witten form, that kind of the will form in here with some things and that's like their W and then they're looking at the imaginary part of this. Um, now, where is the gradient flow equation here? That's the thing, it's not in there. But if you draw the horizontal foliation of any quadratic differential, nice lemma, the vertical foliation, namely, so the horizontal foliation is the imaginary part stays constant. That's the Gaia more nice spectral network, right? The imaginary part of W prime is zero. Now, if you have a quadratic differential and you draw the horizontal foliation, namely the foliation of the Riemann surface for which the leaves have imaginary part equal constant, then the real part is always decreasing or increasing along these leaves. So the horizontal foliation of a double UKB or of a quadratic differential is always oriented by the real part, which means the real part is increasing or decreasing as long as you don't go and hit a zero. Okay, that is exactly this kind of phenomena. The real part is following one of these equations. Now, obviously it's not the same ODE on the nose, but the behavior is qualitatively the same. It's like the real part increases or not, and that's exactly the real part of these two guys, which can be modeled with this. So, right, right, but yeah, exactly. So like, the, Exactly, like, so what, what is the sort of full theorem is like, you have a weave, right? And now there is a choice of J and there is a choice of these limits. And so there is a choice of metric, which defines a gradient for you, which defines for you the flow tree equation, such that you end up drawing a picture. As you modify these parameters, the picture changes a bit, but qualitatively it doesn't. Like maybe the splitting like this happens a bit before or a bit after, 
but the qualitative topological picture stays the same independent of these choices of parameters within you know j compatible you know a certain cylindrical asymptotic so on and so forth so yes the, the topological picture is there is a choice of all the parameters such that the answer is topologically equivalent to this one and now what you can now start to ask is what happens when I go and I do a move like this one and the answer is it happens exactly what occurs for a spectral network when you go through a BPS value so in a spectral network when you start to change the parameter and you hit a finite length trajectory that is exactly the before and after picture of that those are exactly the more slow trees before and after that picture so the reason they get walls of marginal stability the reason they get those transformations in these more slow tree settings is the reason you get Lagrangian this surgery before and after and I I mean I, I think I've said enough things but one thing that I personally really liked as a as a, as a sort of test which we can do later if you want um, are the following two classes of examples one of them is just you take a disk and like think of it as being an n polygon and you triangulate it so you take a triangulation of a polygon and then you draw the dual graph, which is this weave. And then you ask yourself, what are the Morse flow trees for this weave? Answer, it's literally the same as the spectral network. So there's going to be something flowing in here, something flowing in here, one guy arriving in here, one guy arriving in here, one in here. So from this asymptotic place, you hit everybody you can hit. And that, well, sorry. Okay, in Gallardo Mornitsky, the arrows go the other way because they're flowing from the trivalent and out. I, I usually flow in because of the more flow definition. Uh, but this is exactly this statement. So the fact that for a quadratic differential, the Morse flow tree picture, I've been calling it the floor graph, the floor graph coincides with the WKB spectral network of the quadratic differential, that is exactly that lemma over there. That for two sheets, the only rigid trees that you see are of this sort. Right. And then if there was a rep core here, there would be also one, one arriving there. Uh, the rep chord is where this guy starts. Like, the rep chord is where this guy starts somewhere in there. Yeah, so like, you know, here I have a rep chord and then it shoots a bunch of trees, like, out of this. Like, here the rep chords are exactly one per area. Like, they're literally one here, one here, one here. In the pancake, in this five, five place pancake, there's one in every pancake thing. You, you can make it so that there's one in there. So that's a good sort of first test that for the theory of quadratic differentials, it all matches. That was nice. But the test that I really, really enjoyed was doing the BNR equation. So there's this equation called the Burke uh, Nevins Roberts equation. So BNR example, which is the spectral curve. It, it, the, 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 the PDE looks like that. It, like, sorry, the ODE looks like that. Yeah, so, by, so people put a three in there. But it's like that, right? Like, these apply to psi equals zero. Yeah, so, sorry? Yeah, yeah. So this three is really saying, if you, if you instead of partial Z, you just put like W, that's just saying the spectral curve in, in T star of C is three sheeted cover. So the weave will look something like that. So I went into Mathematica, you know, I, I, I really computed the real part associated to this, took the lift, took the front, and I drew the weave. And I, I mean, I can show you the weave, it's nice and everything. And then out of that weave, I computed all the more slow trees and you get exactly the same picture that you get for the WKV spectral network associated to this, which was computed by Kazarkov, Pandit, uh, Simpson uh, in, in a paper called uh, well, like single perturbation theory. And uh, I think, well, anyway, that, was, that paper was about affine buildings. But the point is for this equation in here, which is now three sheeted, there is no kind of natural guess, but you can do the weave that's like entirely new, and then you can do the Morse flow theory, and that recovers like a well known phenomena, which is this the, the point of this paper. This paper was called something like New Stokes Lines. And the point of this paper was exactly that this can happen. So, like when you have a Stokes line arriving like this and a Stokes line here, so you're doing the WKB. You do Borel summation here, Borel summation here and here, and you're like forgetting this one, then this thing is called a virtual turning point. 
So it's like, I mean, I don't know. I was told every physicist knows this, but I don't know. Like when you do the area equation, is everybody okay with that being a turning point? Or like, okay, great. So that turning point is there, right? It's a zero of something, and you see it going from oscillatory behavior to an exponential one. The virtual turning points are things like this one, where there's no apparent zero, and then nevertheless, you have to add a, a line here. So that was the point of this very nice paper. I recommend reading this 80, I think it was 82 paper. And, and now we not only recover that, but we now we generalize this brutally because now I can take any polynomial I want and I can like draw we for you, draw it in any way, compute the Morse flow trees, and then you're gonna end up with like some crazy spectral network. So I ran everything I knew in the literature, so in particular something called Grassmannian spectral networks. I ran this for torus, torus links and torus knots. Uh, you get exactly what you would expect out of the positroid top cell in the Grassmannian, K, comma Km plus N. And then I got funky and I ran a bunch of cables of cables of torus knots and you get some really funky weaves and some interesting spectral networks. But the point is it does recover all spectral networks that I knew of that are kind of interesting with their symmetries. And then you can keep going because kind of the advantage of the Betty side is you never needed to care about the Riemann surface structure. I never need to integrate any periods. So now we, we kind of know what the answer is on the Betty side. Yeah. So Correct, correct. Like, so in, in, in their setup, there is no choice of weave whatsoever, right? But um, what you can do is, so, you know, you, you define this spectral curve. Yeah. Is equal zero, right? And now there's a choice on how do you take the real part, right? So there's the e to the i theta here. And that's, that's always what I choose. Now that's, you can vary these and then you get different weaves. And depending how you vary these, you might see mutations happening. That's the, the I don't know exactly what their name is, but in Kairo Mornitsky, the variation of theta gives you this interesting thing where then you can count BPS at the final many places, uh, discreetly many places. Uh, but fun thing, I was kind of panicky about this, you know, the Greek three polynomial is an elliptic integral. Uh, good news, this is the unknot. So this, <laughs> Despite this being sort of a famous example of everything, the Legendre knot at the boundary is the unknot, and the weave that you get for this guy is just a disk. So in particular, and this is a topological thing, there's no topology, so it doesn't matter what angle you choose, you always are gonna get a disk. So there's no wall crossing there. So in some cases, you sort of know from the get-go you're not gonna get wall crossing. Okay, I think I should uh, wrap up. Uh, thanks for listening, and I'm around if you wanna talk. Burke, Nevins, and I believe it's Roberts, but the title of the paper is something along the lines of new Stokes lines or something or virtual turning points and new Stokes lines. You know, it's a paper back in the day when they wrote short papers to the point. Where you could just sit down during lunch and learn something. About 100 pages. <laughs> I, mean, I have nothing. I'm, I write 100 page paper. I mean, I'm guilty as. as oh, yeah, 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 exactly. exactly. <laughs> kind of, and then there's snakes, and you know, you kind of keep going. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, so this tree, the, the picture really reminds me of this scattering diagram. Right. Okay. So this may be something we need to talk like now calmly, which is sort of an independent question, which is you have the broken lines from GHKK yeah. in the scattering diagram. Yeah. And those are, all, those are used to compute theta functions for the theta basis on that, right? And the question is, is there a more slow tree interpretation of those broken lines? And the short answer should be yes, but now the Lagrangians are, you know, you need to choose a certain symbolic structure in the hyperkeller twister sphere for the hitching space, right? And then you would hope that what they're doing these broken lines is they're counting holomorphic disks, strips, ending in some of these non-exact Lagrangian fibers. Yeah, I guess I, I would 
imagine they are doing like kind of like a, a, like a, a filter of cases. So if you have maybe two very bad events, Yeah, I mean, like, okay, what's what's one way I would really, okay, here's, this is our fault, okay? But if you take a smooth manifold with boundary and you take its cotangent bundle, we currently have no Fukaya category for which the zero section is an object. That is a pathetic statement, but it's, so if you take a smooth manifold with boundary, the disk, uh, and you take its cotangent bundle, I currently know of no Fukaya category for which the zero section is like an object in any like nice functorial reasonable way compatible with stops and everything. Now, suppose that was defined. Then what you can do, like the way you translate this into what you're saying without using scattering diagrams is saying the following is like, suppose, so this is the, how do they call it? Like the millipedes picture in Gayoto Mornitsky. So suppose I wanted to compute the parallel transport. So I'm doing non abelianization now. Suppose I want to compute the parallel transport from here to here. What is this Fukaya theoretically? All it is is I take the cotangent fiber here, and I take the cotangent fibers here. I choose a path rho, and this is a path from P to Q. A path from P to Q, also known as modules over change in the base loop space, like once you do it parametrically. So what this information really is, is the intersection of the cotangent fiber with the spectral network that's on from the cotangent fiber to the spectral network, uh, spectral curve on from the cotangent fiber to the spectral curve, and then ohms from P to Q. So what this non-abelianization picture is trying to do, it's trying to compute the mu3 product, mu2, mu3, a infinity structure in that to be Fukaya category. So you take ohm from this to the spectral curve, spectral curve, uh, ohm from this to this, and then you want output ohm from this to the spectral curve. And the answer is, it's not just the naive matrix that you get here, which would be like 0 minus 1, 1, 0, because the two sheets change. The correct answer, and this Gayoro Mornitsky predicted this, is you must do this as well. You must add an extra thing with there's a certain entry here that is accounted by this thing. And this is exactly the Morse flow tree. Like the reason is there is a Morse flow tree coming this way, and so you should take the trivial one and then the parallel transport for that. So in particular, once you have these more flow trees, you can do non abelianization like in this Fukaya categorical setting by counting all possible deviations for your path ac according to these WKB lines of more flow trees. But that I don't know how to connect with the scattering diagram like immediately. But there you are. There are some algebras which are known to have that property, and and, and they're rare. They're actually classified. Uh, they follow an ADE classification. And if you open your mind, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, like classification. Was that your question? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I I I mean I like explicit examples, right? So just so you know, to n torus link, that's type A. That's what you would get if you took the AD classification of simple singularities. That would be the link of a simple singularity in type A. Those guys, Catalan number. So the half link has the L link, the, the unknot has one, the half link has two, the trefoil has five, the two torus link has 14. Okay. Type D, it's a two n torus link plus an unknot like this. So this is a two n torus link. And then you close it up like this, and then you add this guy. That's type D. That is a version of the Catalan numbers, also. And now E6, E7, E8. Well, E6 is easy. It's the 3, 4 torus knot. E8 is the 3, 5 torus knot. This is a singularity like X cubed plus Y3 to the, to the 4. And E7 is a combination of the trefoil. And then there's an unknot flying around linking with it. Yeah, that's why. Yeah, I have I have this paper which I I mean I don't understand. Like I I've proven it, but which is saying there is a way to if you have a singularity, and you have the Miller fiber. If you choose a real morsification for the singularity, that tells you how to deform the Miller fiber, which is symplectic, into a Lagrangian. 
And then the link at the boundary becomes Legendrian. And the original link of the singularity, which was a transverse knot, because it was the boundary of a symplectic manifold, is the positive transverse push off of the Legendrian. But these are much more finer sort of, you know, typically several Legendrians can give you the same transverse push off. Several Lagrangians, if you perturb them to symplectic surfaces, give, give the same symplectic surface. So that's kind of, anyway, this is a, there is an AD classification. And for these guys, we know there's finally many charts. So we expect finally many fillings. Does that answer it? Yeah. 